Welcome. I am Stu Heller, uh, the moderator of the Data Off Bali Speakers Forum. And tonight I'm delighted to bring you uh, Carol Grant. Um, Carol was raised in Seattle. She's a graduate of the University of Washington School of Physical Therapy, now retired from a 40 year career. You can't tell that by looking at her, mostly in the field of geriatrics. She's married to Rob Grant, her spouse of 37 years. They met in Seattle in their late 20s and were married eight months later. He was not Jewish, but after his first Passover Seder experience, uh, experience, he was all in to have a Jewish household. Rob was active duty Coast Guard for the first 15 years of marriage. And so they lived in six different states, spending time in uh, Southern California, Alaska, the second tour in Washington State, New Jersey, and Michigan. When Rob retired from the Coast Guard, they returned to Seattle. Rob returned to school and graduated with a degree in uh, accounting. He is now retired. They have a 35-year-old adult daughter, Heather, and she was at Mitzvah at their last Coast Guard duty station in a very small congregation in Western Michigan. Carol has done a great deal of hiking and skiing, played the French horn in the Seattle Symphony, and at 48 joined the women's soccer league playing for 12 years. Way to go, Carol. She was uh, introduced to Date Aleph by a spiritual friend who was not Jewish. She cried during her first service, feeling she had found a home. But the closing was when a former board member told her no one ever asked her why her husband didn't show up. We are now about to hear a very riveting story about Carol's mother and her family. Carol, why don't you unmute yourself and take it away. Okay, so I've got to now go back to the screen sharing. So let me see how this works. You should be able to do that. Yeah, this should be it. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. It's working. Okay. I have to wait because there's one more. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. All righty. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Oh, I got to move these boxes. Sorry, guys. Hang on. I'm a little bit new to this. Oh, I got it. Hmm. I got to do something else. Uh, hang on. I, I have to move this, do this and move this little box first. Okay, now I gotta go back to sharing. All right, here we go. So I was asked to talk and I decided that I would talk about um, uh, my mother. So this is in honor of my mother whose name is Eva Ruth Ansel. And originally uh, this talk was gonna be exclusively about her ex Holocaust experience but it went in an unintended direction as a result of two classes with Rabbi Olivier at the temple. One class focused on racism for Black America, and the second class, which is ongoing, um, is about anti-Semitism. Anti These classes led me to a better understanding of both my history and my upbringing. I became more aware of both anti-Semitism and marginalization in my lifetime. This led to an improved understanding of the confusion swirling around my Jewish identity. 
I decided to add some of my own experiences growing up secular as a daughter of a Holocaust survivor and first generation American Jew on my mother's side. So I'm gonna introduce you now to the main character and here she is. That's my mom, Eva, on her 90th birthday. And I am one of five children born to both Eva and Julian Ansel. And here we all are. And Julian is the one in the back row with the thumb in his mouth. And my mother is sitting with the glasses facing the camera, holding a child. And my grandmother, Anna Marie, my mom's mother, is next to her in the green dress. Oh, I did. My mother was always thirsty for knowledge, enjoyed and promoted education, the arts, both visual and performing, had exquisite taste, and was a fiercely competitive athlete. She loved classical music, including opera. She prided herself in her culinary pursuits, especially her baking. My mom played field hockey in high school. As an adult, she excelled in tennis, skiing, hiking, and climbing. She summited a number of major peaks in the Northwest, including multiple summits of Mount Rainier. Every year, my family of seven plus one dog went on overnight hiking excursions in the Olympics and the North Cascades. My mom ran the household, including the finances. My dad worked long hours as a surgeon, teacher, and researcher. He treated patients in Seattle at Children's Orthopedic Hospital, the University of Washington Medical Center, Harborview, and the VA. He was the first department head of urology at UW Hospital Medical Center. My dad's side of the family came to the United States in the 1800s from Russia, Lithuania, Poland, Eastern Europe, wherever the, the lines were. He attended a conservative, conservative Jewish congregation. At age seven, my dad's father was institutionalized due to complications from syphilis. My dad never saw him again. My dad's grandmother, Cecilia Fieldman, supported the family as a practicing chiropractor, and she treated patients in one part of their home. My, dad, um, my dad's mom, Anna, worked in retail clothing, and he had a sister, Shirley, who was 11 months younger than him. And I really feel like you can see the family rec recognition in my own face with my dad's side of the family. My dad was placed ahead in school and started college at the age of 17. World War II interrupted that schooling. He was an officer in the Army Air Force Weather Service. He was in the, on the GI Bill after the war to finish his me medical training. I was raised as a secular Jew. My mother mostly avoided temple. She told me that it made her sad. She said her temple was out in nature, hiking and climbing and skiing. The love of hiking came my way. My mom went to services only on the high holidays and the one Shabbat of the year that my family was designated to help host the Oneg. My being Jewish meant Passover seders with the same three Jewish families for 19 years. The families connected by way of newly re relocating at about the same time, all as physicians at UW Hospital. Growing up in a Jewish household in my family meant we celebrated the major Jewish holidays, but not Shabbat. My children attended religious school. Both my brothers were bar mitzvahed, but the three girls did not have bat mitzvahs. I asked my mom to be a bat mitzvah, but she told me no, because she had to pay for my wedding. <laughs> my mother refused to drive any of the kids to friends' houses to play. She claimed, well, if I have to drive one, then I'm going in five different directions, and that meant that any socializing with my Jewish Sunday school peers really wasn't an option because our reformed temple was about five miles away from our house. I do recall my mom celebrating when there, when there was no more carpooling to temple after over 12 years of commitment. I recall my dad suddenly informing the family of a diet shift sometime in middle age. He no longer would eat pork or shellfish and didn't want it offered in the house. Well, that was a major change because we grew up on European homemade split pea soup from a bone-in lamb, German liverwurst, sausages, salami, and bacon. My dad, dad traveled some for business. My mom would beeline it to the grocery store and purchase a pork tenderloin to cook because he was not around. She did have a little bit of a rebellious streak. When my dad was too busy to commit to cross-country ski lessons, my mom just started on her own. Eventually, he did, he did learn. My mom took lessons as an adult to learn how to play the cello long after she had all the kids start music lessons in the public elementary program. One of the five kids did become a professional musician. 
My mom invested in owning and managing apartment building rentals after her kids were beyond elementary school. She was fiercely independent, an entrepreneur, and a force to be reckoned with. Her climbing friends gave her quite the nickname. Eva Ansel was known as Evil Onslaught in a few circles. Growing up, curious as kids, it was always a struggle, I called it pulling teeth, to wriggle information from my mother about her childhood. I was unaware of the lasting emotional trauma she suffered from Nazi persecution and the impact ultimately it had for me. So now I'm gonna talk about before World War II in Germany. My mom's father, Lulu, was born in 1898 in Munich, Germany. He became an obstetrician gynecologist practicing at a Jewish hospital in Munich. Eva's mother, Anne-Marie, née Totenkopf, was born in Poland in 1906. She grew up in Berlin. When she got married, Anne-Marie dropped out of a law school education track. She spoke of regretting not having completed her schooling to practice law. Anne-Marie and Lulu, his full name was Ludwig, were married on March 16th in 1928. And then my mom was born January 17th, 1929 in Munich, Germany. And here she is, a cutie, uh, probably two and a half. Family on, my, on Anne Marie's side consisted of Eva's grandma, Selma, and grandpa, Isidore Totenkopf, Anne Marie's parents. Isidore died fairly young of a heart incident, about age 59 or 60. Anne Marie had a younger sister, Charlotte, excuse me, an older sister, Charlotte. Um, and that was Eva's aunt. Charlotte married Max Mamlock, and then they had two boys, Peter and Robert. And I don't have a picture of Robert. On her father's side of the family, Lulu, Eva had grandfather Martin and grandmother Tekla Ballin. Grandfather Martin had a brother, Robert, and Robert was married to Bella. Eva's father, Lulu, grew up with one brother, Rudy, but Rudy was killed one month shy of 19 fighting in World War I for the German army. And here's his grave site. I could, couldn't find a photo of my parents, of my mother's apartment where she grew up, where, where she lived in Munich, but I did find um, a photo of Tekla and Martin Ballin's house. And that's Lou, her fa my mother's father's parents. I have no idea how often or when the family chose to see each other. My mom attended public school she spoke of being popular with her classmates. She attended, see, she said she attended birthday parties and had many play dates with friends. Eva's mom, Anne Marie, became ill with polio in 1937. Eva talked about feeling ill and coming home from school. She had mild symptoms, but she passed the virus on to her mother, and Anne Marie was quite ill. She eventually underwent surgery to repair muscle damage in her legs. But the, by the time she had the procedure, there was a lack of rehab and follow-up. Um, oh, sorry. Page. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry, I have the wrong page. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. But by the time she had the procedure, there was a lack of rehab and follow-up um, care for Jews. The surgery ended up mostly unsuccessful, leaving my grandmother, Anne-Marie, with permanent damage. Initially, Anne-Marie used canes to walk, and over her lifetime, the weakness progressed slowly. She ended up using long leg braces for stability and eventually became wheelchair dependent. I don't know what Jewish practices were present in my mom's life before the war in Germany. She never spoke about it. She reluctantly, when pestered, spoke briefly about increasing restrictions for Jews as Hitler came into power and how that changed her life. She admitted her biggest struggle as a nine-year-old was when she could no longer go to school or see her friends. She barely touched on how she felt when she was forced to be identified with the Jewish star on her clothing. And this is my parents' uh, ID card on, on the slide. And the J, of course, is the cover uh, for being Jewish. And then a yellow J on the inside. Eva's mom, Anne-Marie, relayed that the conditions for Jews in Munich deteriorated rapidly after Kristallnacht, no November 9th and 10th of 1938. We did find documents um, for Eva's 
um, family apartment uh, in with the address on it. And their home, when I Googled it, Googled it was only an 11 month, an 11, 11 minute walk from the town hall location where Joseph Goebbels made his famous speech declaring the national initiation of the pogrom against the Jews on Kristallnacht. Stores were smashed and this synagogue that the family attended was leveled and became a parking lot. And the proximity to the speech is important because what happened was um, that night um, and throughout the next couple of days, the German police rounded up men and Eva's father Lulu was rounded up and taken away and no one knew where he was. Well, he, he, here's a um, document uh, that is a release from, and you'll look on the top, it says concentration Schlager Dachau. So this is from the commandant. And it's a release from my grandfather two days after he arrived. Um, and on it, it talks about um, that he's to report directly to the head of the Munich Health Department and the Gestapo headquarters in Munich. And I had always been told the story that he left, uh, and I thought it was Theresienstadt, but it was Dachau, um, because he um, had a patient in labor at the Jewish hospital in Munich. And after Kristallnacht, no non-Jewish physician was going to attend to a patient. So that's my understanding as to how why he got out. And this corroborates that. When I asked my grandmother, Anne-Marie, why the family waited so long to leave Germany, she told me they actually had been considering leaving before 1937, but her getting polio um, interrupted the process. She admitted that they had always felt so very proud to be Germans. They considered being German first. And she said, like many of her friends, they couldn't believe it would get so bad. In March of 1939, at barely age 10, Eva traveled by train with her father, Lulu, to stay with a Jewish family in England. I don't know if he took her the whole way, and I don't know what her travel de details were after the train um, to get across the English Channel. And here's my mom's passport in this slide. And here's the uh, first page. And note, there's the red letter um, designating her as Jewish. Um, I sort of assume it's a copy from the Scarlet Letter of, of Shame uh, from 19, from excuse me, 1642, but that's my take on it. And then what's interesting to note is my mom's name is Eva Ruth Ballin, and underneath that uh, is, hand, is written in Sarah. So the reason is because uh, all Jewish females were identified on German documents as Sarah. And... Again, here is my mom's travel visa or papers that allowed her to leave Germany. And on the line that it says her name, uh, Sarah is inserted, inserted as well. And this is a health review. Um, the stamp at the bottom is the uh, British consulate in Munich accepting the health review. And the box with the Star of David in it designates that this is a form only that has to be that only has to be um, filled out by Jews. Although all three members of the family um, applied for visas to immigrate to the United States together, and here's that application, um, it states that the three, um, it lists my grandfather Ludwig Ballin, my grandmother Anne Marie Ballin, again with Sarah and Dr. Ba Ludwig Ballin with Israel because males were known as Israel and, um, uh, and my mom um, for a visa to immigrate out of the country. Um, so Lulu had a German passport as well. Again, the red note, the red J note uh, designating him as Jewish. And again, if you read the line that has his name on it, it's Ludwig, and then it says Israel Ballin, and he had no middle name. So all males in, in Germany with documentation were had Israel somewhere in their name. Lulu took um, the cruise ship, the SS Venom, in late March from Rotterdam, Holland to New York City. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the second page of his um, passport. And here's the ship in late March, um, 1939 from Rotterdam, Holland to New York City. And he arrived in New York City on April 5th, 1939. 
In April 1940, Anne-Marie did get a visa to join um, Lulu in New York City. It was, it was fairly well uh, common that um, they would let the wife come over. In Anne-Marie's visa application, a friend who was already living in New York City provided an affidavit of support. The friend had known Anne-Marie um, for a while in Germany. Their friend affirmed that she had no children so that she would be able to help support Anne-Marie financially. And then there was, this is a bank letter on this slide um, of a, in trust for Anne-Marie, um, funds to um, prove that she would not be state dependent when she got to America. And then there was a second affidavit from a friend, a uh, physician friend of my grandfather's who said that he was his best friend. And he um, entered the States in 1935 and he had been practicing as an intern since 1936. Not only did he reveal his annual income and his savings on this affidavit, but what was a laugh to me was he said because he was a bachelor that he would have enough to, funds um, to help support Anne-Marie and Lulu in the States. Anne-Marie then made her way with her travel authorization. And it's hard to read, but again, Sarah is added to her name here. By train to Genoa, Italy. Then, and here we have um, the cover of her ticket. She had a ticket on an Italian cruise ship and she was going third class, leaving from Genoa and arriving um, destined with a destination, New York. Uh, and um, the ship was the Conti di Savoy, and I'm butchering it because it's Italian and I don't speak any Italian. And here's a picture of that boat. Eva's grandparents on Lulu's side, Tekla and Martin Ballen, had significant financial resources and some high German political connections. It's not known or it's not clear when they left Germany. But there is documentation that they traveled from Geneva. And here is that documentation on the slide down at the bottom um, to Barcelona and then to Bilbao, Spain. They escaped to Buenos Aires. And on um, this is the visa that allowed them to get out of Germany. And it's the line that is um, where the seal says München. Uh, that is written down, uh, it is Argentina. Uh, in German, it's not as clear on the scan as it is on the original uh, paperwork. Um, they um, went on the steamship Cabo de Hornos, and it's a South American cruise line. Oops, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, and subsequently, interestingly enough, they went to Paraguay, and I don't know anything about wh why they ended up in Paraguay. But after that, um, they ended up being sponsored by their son Lulu to reside in the U.S., and they um, settled in New Jersey um, and lived the rest of their lives there. And now I'm going to talk about uh, life for my mom in England with a Jewish family. So here they are. This is the Richards family. And there's um, Dr. H. I don't know his name. Uh, we'll have to look into finding that out. And Rosalind is his wife. And he has the older son is Andy and the younger son is Barry. And this actually was a photo that is much older than when my mother arrived to them because the youngest son is close to my mother's age. Um, the family um, cared for my mom about, for about 15 months. And um, Rosen was a housewife and um, the um, father um, was a physician. And uh, my mom uh, talked about bonding, especially with Barry and being very, very fond of him. And then, of course, here we are in a new country. So my mom has British ID. And here's the inside. And it does list the area, um, the address that, of the house that she stayed in. My mom told me that at age nine, when she arrived in Britain, she was placed in kindergarten because of the language barrier. She felt a lot of shame. And she was very motivated to learn enough to resume school with her own age group. According to her school records, after two and a half months, she was found competent enough to be placed in a class with her own age group. My mom started at the Landoff School as a day student, but became an overnight boarder just about five months before leaving for the United States. School eval evaluations did not just include grades, but also commented on Eva's general emotional adjustment. And these records were sent to the Richards documenting Eva's progress. And interestingly enough, in this slide, the headmistress is stating that 
Eva is too aggressively English and it's likely to cause difficulties for her since she's not English. And then it says she needs help to accept her nationality, both German and Jewish, and be proud of it. So the Richards were getting these reports as my mom was in school um, and they were caring for him. My mom corresponded with the family, the Richards, intermittently throughout their lives. At some point, Barry returned the letters written by my mom to his parents after she emigrated to the United States. There appeared to be some documents and letters related to the Richard's application to accept and care for a Jewish child in the troves that I was going through, but I just didn't have the time to dive deep into those pieces. I did read a letter from Barry who told my mom that the family had taken in three more Jewish girls from various parts of Europe, Europe after she had left and that they had all survived. My mom did repeat to me a story about an air raid in Cambridge. She was coming home from a friend's house after dark and an alert sounded. She knew she was supposed to go to a shelter, but she had no idea how to get there. In her limited Holocaust retelling over my lifespan, this is the only time I can recall that she admitted that she was afraid. She said a stranger told her to come with him because he was on his way to the shelter. I imagine since she knew what she was supposed to do when the alarm sounded, that going to a bomb shelter was not an unusual event. And now we get into the details of my mom heading for the States. My mom crossed the Atlantic to the United States under a British kinder's transport organization called the Children's Overseas Reception Board. She was on a Br British cruise ship, the SS Samaria. It was part of the Cunard Line. This trip was the ship's maiden kinder transport voyage. It had 900 children on board and a number of adults. It left Liverpool September 24th, 1940, and arrived in New York State, New York City, 10 days later. The SS Samaria was in a convoy of 11 ships on that Atlantic crossing. During the voyage, one ship was sunk by torpedo from a U-boat, a German submarine. My mother was in the final convoy that came to the United States because crossing in the Atlantic after that trip was deemed too dangerous. And this slide has my mother listed. This is just the, the page of the manifest. I have a highlighted slide next. And here she is in the highlighted section. And she's on, in the under 16 um, uh, category. What was interesting is there aren't actually that many um, children on this page of the manifest. Um, most of them are adults, most of them are German. There's a few from Czechoslovakia and there's a few that are listed as um, 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 stateless. Um, in addition, the, you can't see at the top, the head of one column is race or peoples. And you'll notice that um, there's a lot um, uh, uh, listed as Hebrew. And I thought that was interesting. You also can't see it, but at the very bottom of my mom's page manifest um, are four names and it's written that, that these people did not make the voyages planned. And since this was the last chance, um, it's, it's pretty sad, but it does give a record if people are searching for records. So I asked my grandma when her immediate family was spread across three countries and an ocean, and, a, and another body of water, how did she ever think that they'd be reunited? And her response was, you just didn't think otherwise. And this is a letter that my mom wrote back to her English family. And she wrote this letter three days after she arrived in the States after the trip. She identified the boat she was on, she identified the dates to complete the voyage. And she described in that letter how an English plane swooped low and dropped a bomb on a U-boat. She described seasickness on board, uh, not, not only herself, but a lot of other people. And then she did say that there was another girl uh, her age assigned to her cabin. And now I'm gonna go into the New York City challenges. Unfortunately, the family found out that all their goods that they had shipped from Germany were destroyed in the bombing of the Rotterdam Harbor in Holland when it was awaiting transport. Anne-Marie worked in a glove factory in New York City to support the family until Lulu passed his medical boards in English for licensure. He then started up a private medical practice. And I, once again, we get another ID card for my mom who's 13. And this is her alien registration card for the, for the US. And what's interesting and what I, I guess I never really thought about it, but um, 
I can't understand why they, that anyone would need advanced permission for possession of explosives and firearms. But I was surprised, although you have to consider the time frame, uh, they also needed it for ca owning cameras and radios. And then any address change, name change, occupation change, employment change, and travel had to be um, asked for permission ahead of time. And this is factored in uh, a little bit later in the talk. Um, Unfortunately, sh shortly after finally getting settled and maybe on a path to security for the family, Lulu fell very ill. In fact, so ill that he was placed in a mental institution. At some point, a physician in that mental institution discovered that there was a misdiagnosis and he had a thyroid condition which was controllable by meds. So uh, he did recover um, and he got out of the mental institution, but the family had to start from nothing one more time. Lulu accepted a county position as a physician in Braintree, Massachusetts. It included housing for the family. Unfortunately for my poor mother, she had to give up her dog because no pets were allowed in the new location. And I know that affected her because she talked about that um, when she talked about her memories. Because of the multiple moves, then the illness which created more moves and finally a restart for her father professionally, my mom said she attended five different schools. That period added more emotional burdens for her. She recalls being depressed and she complained of gaining weight. And here she is high school graduation after the five, five schools that she was in. And her, her grandparents came for that graduation ceremony. And if you'll note um, that my, my grandmother, Anne-Marie, Eva's mom um, is, is holding on to the two men and her, her knees are kind of locked and her feet are wide. And if you'll notice, there's a cane against the house above the bush. And all that was um, the result of the um, polio uh, damage um, that had happened in, in Munich. Well, the next chapter of my mom's life is much improved, thank goodness. She thrived and loved college. She traveled by train as a commuter into Boston University. She majored in library science, science with a minor in French. My mom and dad met at Lake George in Maine at a Jewish summer resort as co-workers. They were both working their way through college. He was seven years older. Mom's dad, Lulu, insisted that Eva was not allowed to get married until after she graduated with her college degree. Likely, he paid attention to the fact that Anne-Marie had regretted not getting her law degree. So here's my mom at her graduation ceremony. And my folks were married soon after my mom graduated. So she'd been in the United States for more than 10 years as a resident alien by the time she obtained her U.S. citizenship, and that was in 1951, uh, about uh, four months after she got married. My mom had visited Seattle on a trip with her folks when she was in high school. She decided after that visit that she would raise her family there. So when my dad was offered a job at UW School of Medicine after visiting, finishing his medical residency at the University of Minnesota, no, no doubt, they, they ended up there in Seattle. Three of the first five children, myself, the youngest of that crew, were born in Minneapolis. The rest of the family arrived as Seattle natives. I was usually the only Jewish child in my Seattle public school classes. I recall not knowing many of the words to the songs we performed at a Christmas concert. I was asked by my teachers to explain Hanukkah to my classmates. At age 11 or so, suddenly my friends from my class and brownies were attending Christian youth groups and camps. My friends started wearing cross necklaces. I asked my mom if I could wear a Star of David necklace. My mom said, we don't do that. She did not give any further expl explanation or elaborate about the subject. My mom relayed a story that non not long after her arrival in the United States, she was told to speak German to her parents one night a week or she wouldn't get that evening's dessert. She told me she refused to speak German. I recall as a kid, many times she spoke German with her parents and her best friend when she didn't want any kids to take part in the conversation. My daughter, Heather, chose to major in French and German as a result of my mom's diagnosis of dementia at age 80. Heather thought my mom would revert at some point to speaking only in her native tongue and she wanted to be able to converse with her. Heather lived in Germany as a nanny for four German siblings and a fifth foreign, French foreign exchange student in the same household for 18 months. Heather attended language classes while the kids were at school. Germany has a special program to promote return of citizenship to Holocaust survivors and their descendants. 
While in Germany, Heather obtained German citizenship, citizenship through that route. After she returned stateside, Heather told me it was my mom who requested that they converse in German. My husband Rob and I visited Heather when she was in Berlin. I only found out this week, like two days ago, that Heather's nanny family lived in the same neighborhood where Eva's grandma Selma Totenkopf grew up. My mother made a commitment, a comment, letting me know she didn't approve of our trip to Germany. She said that, quote unquote, her father Lulu would be rolling over in his grave, unquote. Well, I didn't have any idea what my response to Germany would be. As it turned out, my showing up in Germany felt more like an act of defiance. My mere physical presence to me felt like a respectful tribute to those who had paved my way. I was grateful for my life, my Jewish lineage, customs, and heritage. A German Jewish prayer book from the late 1800s did surface from my parents' estate. That prayer book traveled through great hardship and was kept by multiple generations. And ultimately it was not discarded. The family members who could not obtain visas to leave Germany were murdered in Auschwitz. And this included Eva's grandmother on Anne Marie's side, Selma. It included her older sister, Charlotte, Charlotte's husband, and both boys, Robert and Peter. My folks' closest social circle was mostly Jewish. They held on to those friendships for six, over 60 years. And my sibs and I continued to have second generation relationships with a few of those families. My folks were married for 68 years and they lived in Seattle for 60 of those years. They died three months apart in 2019. I'm grateful for the availability of various family documents that amazingly survived. This presentation gave me the motivation and the deadline to explore some of the papers boxed up from my folks estate. The, there were many documents that helped validate the murmurs and hazy stories I remember as I was growing up. I'm sad that it raised so many gaps in my personal family history actually gaps of knowledge. I was shocked to find so many photos and documents I'd never seen before and the questions they raised for me. The discharge paperwork from Lulu's Kristallnacht imprisonment at Dachau was a complete stunner. I'd never seen any photo of my mom's Aunt Charlotte, her husband Max, or either of their sons. I'm sorry, I have no idea what kind of Jewish observances were customary in the family on my mother's side. I'm sorry that I don't know about my own grandparents' lives as children with their families in Germany. I want to acknowledge and thank my daughter Heather for her help in clarification of the German documents considered for this pre presentation because I don't know any German. I wanna let everybody know it's the family's intention to share our German family history and the documentation uncovered and there's more of it than what you've seen tonight um, from my folks estate with the Holocaust Center. Thank you for honoring the light my mom blazed as witnesses to, comp to her complicated life story. And that is the end of my talk. So now I'm gonna escape this way. And I don't know if there are questions or comments or if anyone has anything they want to talk about. I'm grateful you're all here. Brought tears to my eyes listening to you. I do. Re I said it, it brought tears to my eyes listening to you. I do remember your parents, Eve and Julia. I, I do remember them from Temple Beth Am. Yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Well, you did a great job, Carol. Thank you for delivering that lovely history. Good job. There's, Thanks. there's so much communal history. I mean, having been you know, one of the three families growing up, you know, the Passover Seders and who brought what and how we got together and rotating houses and, you know, your grandparents being there. I mean, it just is such a strong foundation of my own childhood and identity. Um, I'm, I'm Caroline, a friend of Carol's. Um, I was struck by Eva's love of hiking and the fact that her mother couldn't walk without 
assistance. Thank you for sharing all of this. It was excellent. I think it's amazing that you have all that documentation. Um, Stu, as he probably is plaguing everyone, called me and asked me about um, talking about my family. And I mean, we have hardly anything. I think the, the most, and, and it's just really, listen, watching you me, really made me curious as to, um, I mean, my parents were born here, but as to what happened before they got here. I mean, none of my grand, only one of my grandparents, but, but the, the documentation, I mean, the actual ship they came in and the pictures of the houses and what a gift to have all of that. Who, who was it that was responsible for saving things in such an organized way? <laughs> Uh, well, um, it, it wasn't completely organized. So when the, <laughs> when, when, the when my parents passed away, um, there was more organization um, done by the family. Jody, my sister, who was here, did some. Uh, my sister Ellen did some. And then I'm I'm going through only one box of of two, and I just kind of was able to call through and pick out. Oh gosh, this. Oh gosh, that. And it was like a treasure trove because I kept finding more. So my talk kept sort of morphing. And actually, I don't remember when I talked to Stuart. It must have been two, maybe three weeks ago, when I talked to Stuart. I think I had fifty some slides, and by the end, I had I think 70, 75 slides. So I just kept finding more information, wow. and it allowed me to then put it in sequential. Some, some sequential type of order. Um, um, and, and, and so there's more that, there's more letters to go through. There's more documentation that I didn't get to. So uh, when it goes from us to um, a Holocaust center, um, the hope is that if we haven't done it, that they'll you know, uh, maybe be able to create um, uh, uh, the, logical sequence of events mm -hmm. as to how they happen we're i'm not sure we you know we haven't we haven't gotten there yet but we're, we're... It's, it's such a blessing because you get to assert my my sister that's patty down there in the screen somewhere and i were talking about our family history and that, you know you get to this you turn around one day and there's no one to ask yeah you know all of a sudden there's like wow there's, there's just nobody we can ask nobody knows this and it's such a um I mean, it's way, it's, it's way after my parents died. I said, you know, I'll be like, what if we, wait, who, no one knows this. And it's, it's such a loss, that feeling, I think. Well, and I guess it was, you know, obviously to me, it was like, it was too painful. It, it couldn't be, it couldn't be opened by her. And by the, and when, mm -hmm. when we got some of the material actually, um, you know, we have families, we have lives, and, and it's just very busy. And um, my sister, Jody, did interview both my parents in 2000. No, what, what year was it, Jody? Do you remember? I think it was 2004 or something like that. Yeah. I'm not sure. But so even the trouble was that, that mom didn't want to talk about it. And I also interviewed our grandmother, as did our sister, Ellen. And by the time I interviewed our grandmother, you know, she she couldn't remember uh, anymore, you know. So by the time mom wanted to, was, I don't know about wanted to, but at the time she was able to talk about some of this stuff, a lot of her um, clear memories were uh, not there as well. So. And I'll, I'm Carol's sister, Ellen. Um, Thanks, Carol, for doing that. Um, I, I'll also say that when I interviewed my our grandmother, um, that there was a lot of shame for her associated with um, being here, being having escaped, but her sister and and her sister family not. And um, she, I was amazed that she expressed that, but I think that also led her to um, not want to do a lot of talking. Did she, did she, Ellen, did she ever hear from the family in, in Germany? Were, were they all um, in, the, in, the, in the camps? And did you, so she never heard from any of them again? Correct. 
That's so sad. Yeah. What about the family that came from Argentina and then moved back up here? Do they have descendants that you know of, that you know? So the family that, that moved to Argentina was the grandparents. So they were oh. on my on my on my grandfather's side, my great grandparents. What I don't know is is if on the ticket, it listed the brother and his wife, and I don't know what happened to them. I have no idea what happened to them. Oh. But they made it to Argentina. Yeah. yeah. Carol, what about the Richards family in England? Have you stayed? Anyone stayed in touch with them? You know, I uh, no, um, but they are the Richards family. Um, I they're all gone. I know. I know that Barry passed away, and he was the youngest. Um, and so I, I, it may be that if we go through more letters, we find out a little bit more. I don't know. Mm. But what I do know is I have the names of the three girls that were my mom's age. Um, so the there might be uh, some sort of record that could be researched that direction as well. I, I, I had no idea that they sponsored more, more kids after my mom. I don't think my mom did either until Barry wrote her. Um, Carol, we don't know if um, Barry or his brother got married and had children. Uh, I, yes. I, think, I thought they did, but. Yeah, we, I, I, so in the letter, when Barry was catching mom up on events, he, he um, uh, I think he married a second time um, because he was talking about, this was when mom and dad had been married for 60 years. So it wasn't that long ago. It was about, you know, um, we, it was about eight years before they died. Um, and he got mom caught up that he'd had a second marriage, I think. But we have to go through documents because I, I couldn't read all that stuff. It's just so much. This has been very moving for me. Thank you so much, Carol, and everyone who participated. And I, I was one of the families that did Pesach together, Seders. And it just makes me like know your family more and know Eva more and understand more. So thank you. Well, that's that's what happened when I when I delved in all this this work is I found out more about why things were were really kind of weird for me when I was growing up. It was it was, and I I hadn't thought about it before. Um, but um, it, so this this in it's a it's a sharing and it's it's an honor to my mother, but it was also a self discovery kind of thing. So it was it was it, you know it was really uh, quite. Uh, 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 it was really like this treasure trove of, of, of understanding and, and it just finding out about parts of the family that I didn't know anything about. And so it was, it was lovely. It really was lovely. Carol, um, do you think it's possible that you chose to become a physical therapist? because of observing your grandmother walking with her two canes? Well, actually it was her idea. So we had, um, when we were young, a house with a horrible access uh, for someone who was handicapped. It was stone rocks, one rail, not two. The stones were not even, they were inclined, they were dipped. It was awful. And um, my grandmother would have to walk um, that was the uh, that was the most level access. The, if she went the other way, there were like you know fifty stairs. So I would walk with her down those stairs, across the grass, and down the stairs, and she would hang on to me. And I was fourteen at the time, and she said to me, "You know, you should be a physical therapist because you do this naturally. You let me go at my pace. When your grandfather takes me, I, he's rushing me, and he makes me go at his pace. So that yes, mm -hmm. I definitely became a physical therapist as a result of of a variety of things. But one of what which was the comment about how she felt um, comfortable with me when I walk with her.
Carol, um, this is Stu, uh, a, a comment and then a question. Um, <clears throat> my father wrote a number of books and one of them was called Kiel and Haya, which was about his parents. And he actually wrote a book about a half an inch thick of the stories that he'd heard about their lives in Poland and the children they'd had there and how they came to the United States and their struggles on getting started. And uh, so he, he preserved for us at least his view of their history. Of course, I had no way of checking on his uh, interpretation of the facts, but my, my brother and I sent a copy of that book um, to the Ellis Island Foundation because my grandfather and grandmother, they came through Ellis Island and there's a library there. Uh, and so they thanked us and I've, I've never been there to look, but I think there's a copy of that book there and maybe you might think about a broader distribution of the stuff you've put together. The question, and I, I know you, you talked more about it when we were rehearsing this, but how do you feel about being alive? About being here, about, I guess I don't even need to finish the question. Yeah, well, it was, that was big. Uh, it, it just, I, I couldn't believe it when, you know, one is in Germany, one is traveling and, 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 and going with, with placing my mother in a, in a, in, in a foreign country. And then he's making his way and war breaks out. I mean, it, it just, it's nuts. And anywhere along the way, if something had have gone wrong, uh, you know, um, wrong, wrong in terms of, of loss of life, I wouldn't, I wouldn't exist. Absolutely. I felt very, very much like, wow, it's a, it's a miracle that I am present, that I am, that I'm here. It's a, no, it's a miracle. Not, me too. Um, if my father hadn't left, I wouldn't be here. But, but uh, I'm not me. Go. Yeah, if, if any of you are, are not asking a question now, uh, would you mute your microphones? Thanks. Hey, Mom. Mom, can you mute your microphone? Goldie. What? Well, Goldie, mute your microphone. <laughs> I just muted it to my... There you go. Yeah, I don't know who's going to write a book about this family. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to do it or not. Um, actually, um, I was talking with a friend, and um, we'll see whether I end up maybe doing some volunteer work through the um, um, Holocaust Center in Seattle. Uh, I don't know. Um, at the moment, I just wanted to get through this talk. <laughs> um I was a social worker at Jewish Family Service in um, New Jersey, and we had groups, therapy groups. We called them second generation, uh, which you probably know about that, right? And th there was a whole syndrome of personality traits that we called them second generation survivors that that characterizes population. And it was just fascinating. And I recently uh, went to a, a talk at the Holocaust Center from a woman who, um, whose mother was a Holocaust survivor and she had um, been in one of these groups and we, we connected and we talked and it was just a great experience for her. It, uh, really illuminating. Yeah, I have much more um, uh, capacity and respect uh, for my mother. 
Um, I mean, the, 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 when the, these things happened when I was so young that I just, I didn't understand why they were happening the way they were happening. And um, uh, it, it, it just, um, it just gave me uh, um, a much bigger, much larger view of, of, of who she was and, and why I ended up the way I ended up. Mm -hmm. um, it makes sense. It does make sense. Carol, I have a question about your mother and Heather. So when Heather went to Germany, became a German citizen, all that, I, uh, I mean, if this is too pers personal, you can just skip over it. But I was wondering if there was like tension between them. Was Heather able to openly tell your mother everything about her experiences there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 well, so, you know, my mom, um, she was very much in the present um, because she had dementia. Um, and also, it was interesting that she told me she didn't approve of my trip, but she was such a, a lover of education. And she, I think that gave her the, and Heather was her granddaughter, not her granddaughter. And so maybe that gave, gave her a different slant. But I don't, I'd have to ask Heather, but I don't recall my mother ever speaking in a way of disapproval of, of Heather's um, pursuits at all. Good. Yeah, that is pretty interesting that she disapproved of you, but not her friend. Well, and then coming full circle, if Heather hadn't have known German, um, it would have been a lot harder um, to figure out what these documents said because I don't speak a lick of it. I mean, I could have gone to someone, but it, it just, here, here we come full circle as far as I'm concerned, you know, and, and the, 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 I was struck by a couple of things in Germany and Heather knows the education system there uh, because she was working with these kids from the age, what the youngest was, I think four, when she started and the oldest was 12. And so she knew this, the span and, and in, I think it's first grade, the Holocaust is, is um, taught in school because it goes into more depth later, but it's introduced and, and they're very um, specific about uh, how it happened and how it, it's not, you know, they don't want it to happen again. And, and you know, how, what happened and, and how there weren't enough people to stand up to what, what you know, uh, was wrong. And, um, um, you know, they, it, it, it just starts at a very young age. And we visited a museum in, in Germany called the Resistance Museum. And it's about Jews who did resist. And, um, and there was a, a, a class from um, college, young college, so not their specialty, but they were in a class from college. And um, it, there was a taped uh, interview before they went through the exhibit and after, and they also went to a, a concentration camp. And just the kinds of humanitarian things that these kids were saying, it just gave you so much hope because they, they identified with the tragedies, with... Um, uh, um, with the uh, German population, uh, uh, if not being ex explicitly um, um, uh, involved with persecution, they were implicitly. They, you know, no, nothing was said, and things just kind of morphed. and And it just it it was it was really amazing. It was really um, quite. Um, these kids go and they help. Um, uh, uh, take care of the, the um, grounds and uh, do tours. And it was, it was quite amazing um, what these kids were, were, were doing and saying and um, uh, a relief. So, you know, um, it, it's, there's, it is not shirked from. They, they start very early and they are educated about what went on. Isn't it ironic when you say that? You think of all these parents going to board meetings and storming about critical race theory in America. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's a shame. It's a shame. Different because... cultures, right? Yeah. Well, different we... after cultures. Because I, 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 I was in Denmark and I had a um, 
girl as a as a guide um she was probably about 25 she was go, going to college and she was from northern uh, like um by hamburg and she told me that it was just she said it was drummed into my head what a terrible thing the holocaust she said from the time she said she said from the time i was four or five that's all we she said we heard it so much and i think that's really um a tribute to someone i don't know who you know who's responsible for that but and it doesn't make up for things, but at least it's a step in the right direction. Well, it's a it's a it's a way to to prevent it from happening again. Yes, yes. That's that's. Although we are we're all having our trouble with um, the the political issues um, ongoing in our in across the world, um, but um, I also had a friend in Michigan who was a preacher. And um, we were running together on Christmas day. And she said that um, she was at that time, she was a little younger than I was. So she was probably in her uh, early thirties. And she said that, you know, from very early on, it, she just, she, she said, I, I feel guilty. I, you know, um, because this is what was talked about that it's our fault. And um, um, it just, it, it, it is, it is a way to educate people and to, and to get the message across very early. But they don't really teach, I mean, they don't really teach the, the Holocaust in high schools anymore. Yeah. I mean, because history goes, uh -oh. I think, uh, they start history, um, I don't know, it was like careers. I mean, they don't, I mean, some classes might, but in general history, they don't cover it anymore. I'm going to shut up now. I just want to thank you again, Carol, and say um, good night. And it's really nice to see representatives from all the three families that got together for Sayer, the Ansels, the Stolovs, and the Silvermans. So um, very nice to see everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye, Amy. Oh, Carol, I want to thank you for a spectacular and very moving presentation. It was obvious that you put in a great deal of work, a great deal of heart and yourself into it. And I think we were all very fortunate to be able to benefit from it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stu. That, that's lovely. And I appreciate everyone being here. Good night, everyone. Good night. We'll see ya. Uh, oh, thank you. In two thank weeks. You, everyone. Good night. In, Good job, Carol. In two weeks, we're going thank to you, Carol. have Philip and Cam Herzog, who are going to talk about their decision to um, move from Seattle and retire in Medellin, Colombia. And why they did that, how they made that decision, and what life is like down there in Colombia. So please join us on January the 19th as we continue this Beta Aleph Bali Speakers Forum. Thank you, be well, and good night. Night, everybody. Night. Thanks, Carol, it was wonderful.